Hello, I'm Donna Collins, Executive Director of the Ohio Arts Council. Today's conversation comes to you from the agency's Arts Beacon of Light, Finding Hope in the New Normal, a project inspired by our board member, Tina Houston. Through the Ohio Arts Beacon, we aim to give our artists a place to share, connect, and cope with the challenges presented by COVID-19. We hope to inspire you while giving artists a platform for connection, expression, and encouragement. You're gonna love today's segment because I'm joined by Ohio artist, educator, and teaching artist, Kevin Lyles. Welcome, Kevin. Hi, Donna. Thanks, thanks for inviting me today. Absolutely. You know, Kevin, as a sculptor, an educator, and teaching artist, your life must be fully engaged in new ways of communicating, teaching, and creating. I just can't imagine it. In your artistic work, I know that you're influenced by nature. So I'm curious, have you made time to be out in nature these days? And what have you come across that's inspiring some new work for you? Well, I, I'm actually, Donna, getting to spend a lot more time in nature than I normally do this time of year. Uh, this is generally, well, it still is finals week, but we're doing everything from home. But generally, this is a really busy time at school, and I don't get time to get out at all. Um, I also, uh, I have two really great hobbies. One is mountain biking, and one is fly fishing. And so here in Southeast Ohio, we have lots of ponds that I've, I've been fly fishing in. And the university where I teach, um, a couple of years ago, Bob, the Bob Evans original farms are, are down there right in the Rio Grande Valley. And, and the corporation donated 400 acres uh, to the university. And out there in, those, in that acreage, we have about 20 miles of mountain bike trails. So I get to do that pretty often, which is, which is a lot of fun. Um, as far as creativity goes, I, I have been spending a lot of time in the studio and I really like the spring. Uh, one of the things about the spring that is so nice are all the small buds coming up and the new life and the growth and the little plants that I can't even identify. And so I've been building a lot more work that's smaller with this time off. And uh, I think it's more intimate like those things that come out in spring, or at least I hope it is. Wow, I'm a little jealous. That uh, large piece of land you talked about sounds pretty inviting. You know, the, co yeah, the COVID-19 crisis is impacting artists in different ways. And I'd love for you to share how it, it's impacting your engagement with students and colleagues. I know that you're fortunate to have a very close-knit uh, family of uh, colleagues at Rio Grande. Um, and, and while you're talking about that, share with us any innovative ways you've been connecting. Give us some good ideas. Well, one of the things that's happened, I think, is that the administration has caught on to uh, go to meetings and Zoom. And so I think I'm having more meetings than I've had in half of my career there at Rio Grande. Um, kind of just kidding there, but I am seeing uh, through those meetings, I'm having a lot more interaction um, with my colleagues across campus than I normally do because we have pretty frequent meetings with, with this. And, and I think that's probably not gonna change a lot. Um, my students are probably messaging me more and uh, texting me and emailing me more than I have ever had in my career, which isn't, isn't such a bad thing. Um, in my teaching with the students, uh, one of the things that, that we require in our art department at Rio Grande is that every single art major every semester must visit a museum and document that visit. Uh, you know, we live in Southeast Ohio where there are not a lot of museums, so we make them, them go places to see art. And so, of course, usually that is in real life. Um, this time it's had to be via the internet. And, and one of the cool things that's happened because of this pandemic is I think that museums are really stepping up to the plate and making, making it much more available than it normally is. I had a student um, who wants to be a landscape architect and she made it home to Puerto Rico. She lives in Puerto Rico and, and she had to complete that assignment via visiting the museums via, via the internet. And uh, she told me that she went all over the world before she finally connected with, with one that, that she saw an exhibit that she really, really liked. 
and it turned out it was in New Orleans, the New Orleans Museum of Art. And, and I think that's pretty neat because um, they would have never done that before. You know, that, that really opened up that opportunity. I, I teach a class uh, called Art Criticism and Philosophy. And we get into these really deep discussions about the nature and meaning of the arts and why they are valued and that kind of thing. Because of this transition, uh, we've turned that into a, a movies class. So each week we've watched a film online, either about art or about artists. And then uh, we spend the rest of the week uh, discussing that on Blackboard. And I've noticed that um, I think internet discussion is a lot like singing in your car. Uh, you know, when I'm in a normal class, about half the students are kind of introverted and they don't want to say much. But because the whole class relies on their discussion, they have time to think about it and do that kind of thing. And so the discussion has been unbelievably deep. And I've learned a lot from my, my students and from these films. One neat thing that happened, we watched a film on the dissident artist uh, Ai Weiwei. And um, he had a show in 2010 in the Tate Modern where he had 100 million porcelain sunflower seeds. So we watched the film and we discussed his work and all that. And then that evening after that film was over, I got on eBay and I found out we could buy uh, 200 of those seeds for $40. So I bought 200 of Ai Weiwei seeds and we all chipped in five bucks. So the kids all got, uh, you know, 40 seeds or something. And uh, it was pretty neat. And, and you can kind of thank the internet for that kind of thing. Well, you're right. That's innovation at its best. You know, I know that you love working with college age students um, and there's such a connection. I've seen you with them and it's so engaging. But in recent years, you've well, for lots of years actually, but in recent time, you've worked on a project that I know about in Portsmouth with April Deacon. She's an artist herself, but for this conversation, she's the visual art teacher at Portsmouth High School. That project was part of the Ohio Arts Council's research on reinventing our artist in residence program to what you know today as Teach Arts Ohio. And through Teach Arts Ohio, we're able to engage teaching artists to supplement the work of professional arts educators with our K-12 students. They can be in the classroom for nine weeks, a semester, or a year, and it's a no-match grant. So what can you tell us about that conversation you had with April that very first day and the project? Um, and how it empowered you and students to have a really engaging opportunity through the Human Rights Garden Project. When I remember back to that, I believe that was in 2016, uh, April called me and I, I felt really fortunate when it was all, all said and done that she had invited me to be, be part of this, um, this Human Rights Garden that she had thought of. From my understanding, the um, the old artist in residency program had kind of run its course and um, it was time for something new. And so I think you guys at the Ohio Arts Council came up with this idea of having these longer stays in the schools with artists uh, to make more of an impact. And so uh, it just so happened uh, that semester and, and into the next that I had one day off of school a week that I, I wasn't teaching. And so I got on board with April and um, I went down there, I think, if I remember correctly, between five and six months every, every Wednesday for five or six months and work with those kids. And uh, I had never really worked with a bunch of high school kids. In fact, my entire teaching career has been in the colleges. I went down there and uh, the students and I worked in these teams and we built this large uh, outdoor sculpture out of stainless steel and cast bronze and architectural parts. You know, Portsmouth was a booming town in the 1920s, but, and because of that, they have lots of these old 1920s buildings like post offices and banks and that kind of thing. Uh, but it, now it's in, in pretty dire circumstances financially. And so, the, uh, the maintenance director had saved uh, architectural parts 
from all these demolished buildings that they had torn down. And he had an entire boneyard of these beautiful carvings and uh, big ceramic columns and all that kind of thing. And so I took the students over this boneyard and we together designed this sculpture and worked on waxes and all that. When it was said and done, I brought 40 students up to the college where I have a foundry and cast all of their um, all of their bronzes for this thing. But uh, in the end, seven of those students applied for college. Uh, but I'm convinced it was because of that experience. So those kids down there are, um, they're ornery. I had a great time working with them, but they're ornery and uh, they're high school kids and but they have a hard time. Uh, Portsmouth is depressed. They have a lot of drug problems. And I think this Teach Arts Ohio program taught them that um, college might be an opportunity for them. The arts might be an opportunity for them. And uh, I think it's a great idea. Since then, I think, um, I think uh, April has had uh, eight visiting artists or scientists or landscape designers all kinds of people have come in to expand that human rights garden. I, I believe she even has a, uh, as part of the garden, she has a, um, a food pantry. And um, I think she was explaining to me the other day that she'd like to extend it and bring in a playwright to work with those kids. And so I think there's been five or 600 kids that have been uh, highly impacted. And I think it has been a great project. Kevin, you have made my day, my week, maybe my year. Um, I'm so excited to hear this from your perspective about the impact of teachers and artists working together to provide experiences for young people. Um, yeah, my day could be over now. I've heard the best <laughs> thing I could hear all day. Thank you. Well, well, don't don't leave me uh, stranded with this interview by myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, I won't do that. In fact, I have another question. Okay. So, in preparing for our conversation today, I was thinking about who you might name as the artist in the world that inspire you. So, I'm really going to go out on a limb here. Will you share with us a few of your favorite artists, well known, up and coming, uh, whoever? work you're attracted to and, and why so? Yeah, that's a really tough question, um, but a good one. Uh, and I also teach art history, so I, I'm always digging for more artists that I might not necessarily know about otherwise. But uh, I've always been a fan of, uh, of the work of Martin Poirier. Uh, I love his, um, his simple approach to form and um, the textures that he uses and the uh, materials. And, and although I absolutely love color in, in artwork, I'm not very good at it. And, uh, and so I'm drawn to artists who don't apply color to their work. Um, and so I really like Puree for that. There's an Argentinian artist uh, named Leon Ferrari. And Ferrari does these absolutely spectacular linear wire sculptures that are so dense, you just don't understand how he pulled it off. There are just so many pieces of wire in there. And uh, I'm really attracted to the repetition and pattern and texture and that kind of thing. I saw um, a young artist that I don't know very much about and I, um, I had never known about him, but I saw him back in the fall at the um, at the uh, Whitney Biennial uh, named Robert Benton Bender. And he does work a, a little bit like Ferrari, except uh, Benton Bender's work are more organic and he has little objects in there, kind of found objects, but lots of wire. Um, a lot of the African art has that density that I really, really like. The, the last artist I'd like to tell you about is actually a Jackson uh, native. And that was Fletcher Benton. Fletcher, uh, grew up in Jackson and went on to become kind of one of the uh, founders of the kinetic art movement back in the 1950s. Uh, he, he hung around and knew people like Wayne Tebow and Jasper Johns and George Rickey and I mean the, the high powered things. But uh, I was really fortunate over the years to develop a really good friendship with Fletcher and, uh, and was able to go out to his San Francisco home and work with him and, and stay in this beautiful apartment above his studio probably 
15 times and uh, he became a mentor to me and uh, a lot of what I do is not does I don't emulate his work but but I learned a lot about uh, doing outdoor pieces and the world the sculpture world from Fletcher so I'm gonna throw him into that mix. I love that a Jackson person yay. Um, so Kevin this is a perfect segue to my next question I'm really interested in the commission work you've done over the years. Um, talk to our audience about how you marketed your talents to the world, how you made yourself available for both small and really quite large commissions over time. Well, I think one of the things that, uh, that I did um, early on in my career, you know, I'm an introvert and I don't really like talking about my stuff all that much. And, um, and even early in my career, I, uh, I was reluctant to put good titles on my work. Uh, everything would be called untitled work number four or untitled column or something like that. And uh, somewhere along the line, uh, I learned that I needed to communicate better with my audience. And so with that early work, I was getting in lots of shows. I was even winning quite a few of them, but it, it seemed I hardly sold anything. And so when I learned to do better with titles and to talk about my work, um, all of a sudden I started connecting with clients better and my work kind of took off there. Uh, at our college in the art department, we make every single one of our students write artist statements. Every time you turn around, they get kind of tired of it, but, uh, but they seem like uh, it does them good. Um, I, I've been really lucky. Um, I, I and, and really blessed. I, I, um, I think God has really taken care of me, but I also think that uh, success comes, I've always loved this phrase that I, I think success comes when hard work and preparation meet opportunity. And so um, I, I try in my career to be prepared for things. If I'm asked to do a show or to do the Teach Arts Ohio sculpture or to do this interview, uh, I try to say yes if I can, if the time helps, and I think um, I think that stuff helps a lot. As far as those commit the outdoor commissions go, um, I discovered a couple of decades ago that there are lots of opportunities um, for for small sculpture parks at in small towns or in, at universities or uh, parks often have sculpture competitions. Generally speaking, there's not a huge amount of applicants. And generally speaking, they'll pay between a thousand and two thousand dollars to borrow your work for a year for their sculpture park. And, and usually they'll have 10 to 12 openings. And so um, in earlier in my career, uh, I started applying for those and that that did a lot of things. It, uh, it, it helped me to um, to develop a track record of having outdoor pieces. Uh, if you were in, uh, you got a couple thousand dollars, which would help you buy tools or more materials. Uh, it helped me network. Um, it did lots of that kind of thing. And so um, that really set me up for doing the bigger outdoor commissions. And, and then when I do those, um, I think it's really, really important to, uh, if you're selected as a finalist, to really listen to your client and find out what they've got on their mind. Uh, it, it's really important to me personally, and I think it helps, helps a career to be as professional with everything that you can. Uh, you, you do the best you can on the design, you do the best you can on the, um, on the maquette if it's needed, you do just absolutely fantastic. If you get the commission, then you be as professional as you can be and you be easy to work with uh, because word will get around that, that here's an artist that that's a pleasure to work with. And so I think doing all that kind of stuff kind of helps a career. That's great advice. Thank you for that. I know, I know we've spent some time talking about your role as an artist and a teacher, but I, I want to build on something you were just talking about. Um, Think about, if you will, if, if you are talking to the artist in our audience today, what else would you share with them about the work to be done, the role of the artist at this unprecedented, unprecedented time in our lives? 
what do you see as the role of the artist today? One of the things that has been kind of interesting to me is that, um, you know, sometimes being an artist is, is an uphill battle. Uh, the arts are the first things to be cut when budgets hurt. Uh, arts are the first things sometimes to, to go in the schools and, and um, that's really been, that's tough. That's a, that's a hard thing that, uh, that you've got to deal with if you want to be involved in the arts. But, I, but I've noticed over this pandemic that, um, that we're relying more and more on art than we ever have. Um, I think when this is all over in a decade and we look back a decade from now, we're going to remember this by those big graphic design maps of the, unit, of the world with the red dots all over them. We're going to remember the videos of the Italians singing from their, you know, balconies. We're going to remember those um, empty streets of New York in photography or people on ventilators. And so I think the arts are, are really, really important. Uh, we're, we're able to live pretty well right now without all these sports teams. I mean, we miss them. And it's, it's fun to watch, uh, you know, the, the big events, but, uh, but we're relying more and more on the arts. Um, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. All the artists that I know are, are really worried about that and concerned. Uh, I think there's some optimism, especially in sculpture. Um, uh, there are more commissions that are coming up. The, the timetables have changed. Uh, but right now I have three applications out. For, for you know possible projects. Um, I think it, it's hard to define. I was just talk, talking to one of my older students yesterday and we couldn't quite put our finger on it, but you know, it, it's, there's, there's no question that things are gonna change because of all of this. And we don't know what that change will be, but, but we both had this gut feeling that the arts are gonna play a big part in it. Um, it's going to be tough. There's going to be some museums that are going to close down and, and uh, it's going to be hard. But I think in the end, uh, I think we're all in this together and artists are going to be appreciated maybe more than they were in the past. So I think there is some optimism out there. I agree with you 100%. Optimism is the way to go. The arts folks have always been the creatives, right? the innovators, the people who can take a problem and find a solution, not one solution, but multiples, and recognize how something that fits at the, a large museum may not fit at a small one, but there's adaptation and that happens so easily. I'm also thinking about um, the world as you described, the maps and the dots and the ventilators and thinking about how we at the Ohio Arts Council in Ohio will be able to look back and feel good about the leadership of our state. I'm not sure if you're aware, but uh, our governor, Governor DeWine, has been so supportive of arts education. And it shows in the budget that, that he and the legislature provided to our council to distribute across the state. I know these are tough economic times, but we will come out on the other side of this better, smarter, more engaged, and probably more appreciative of the things we have in Ohio as compared to some other places in the country and the world. So I should get off my soapbox. Um, <laughs> Kevin, this has been a wonderful conversation. And as we wrap up, I wanna thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for saying yes. Um, I know you always say yes. So that was an easy <laughs> ask for you to be an interviewee. Um, you are a beacon of light. And together we're finding hope in the new normal. To our audience, for more inspiration and stories from Arts Beacon of Light, Finding Hope in the New Normal, we welcome you to visit us at oac.ohio.gov forward slash Ohio Arts Beacon. And you can also follow the OAC's Arts Beacon of Light on Instagram at Ohio Arts Beacon. We hope our artists will submit their stories and share the light in their lives with the world and with all of us through this project. Until next time. Let's all find hope in the new normal. And remember, the arts in Ohio are better when we work together.